And for those of you who are new to Lambda, we are the oldest and largest national organization working for the full recognition of the civil rights of LGBT people and those living with HIV. And we do it through education and public policy and in the courts. And we maximize the support that people give us by taking cases that are going to have broad impact on the LGBT community. And I'm going to tell you about a few of those cases tonight. I always have an awful lot of fun talking to our women supporters because as you're about to hear, women once again are leading the way on our docket. It's like we always say, if you want the job done, just call a lesbian. So I'm gonna start off telling you about one of our very favorite lesbians these days. Her name is Karen Galinsky, and she didn't come looking for a fight, but a fight sure found her. So this story started simply enough a few years ago. She got married to her spouse, Amy. She's a federal employee. For years, she had wanted to provide Amy with health coverage through her employment, just like all of her heterosexual colleagues can do. So they got married. She went to her employer and said, you provide spousal health care. I now have a spouse. I'd like health care for her. I'm working just as hard as everybody else. I'm doing the same job. I should get the same pay. And the federal government said, not so fast. DOMA. We can't give you health benefits because of the so-called Federal Defense of Marriage Act. So Karen tells me that back when we started her case, and it was a simple administrative proceeding, and we were hoping that would take care of it, she used to joke with Amy, you know, I don't want to make a federal case out of this. <laughs> Here it is, 2011, and she has one of the leading federal challenges to the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, and we're very, very proud of all of her work on the case. Very, very exciting. So let me tell you, this is a really exciting moment in this case because we are on the brink of our hearing. We have given the judge all of the evidence. We've filed our final motion in the case, and we've asked him to rule for us and decide that DOMA is unconstitutional. That will happen in October. Um, and one of the most recent highlights was a brief filed by the Federal Department of Justice. Some of you may remember, some, sometime back in February, the Department of Justice came to its senses and agreed with something we've been saying for years and years, which is you just cannot defend DOMA when you're looking at it with the kind of constitutional scrutiny that this sort of discrimination deserves. They finally agreed with us and they filed a beautiful brief in the case that actually is a really honest accounting of the painful shameful ways that the federal government has contributed to the discrimination against our country. It's a really extraordinary day when you have your federal government standing up and saying, I am responsible. I have helped make this situation terrible, and I'm here to help fix it. So we're hoping that the judge is going to agree. We will have some news to announce, hopefully not long after our hearing. This will be one of the next cases to make an announcement about DOMA, and it will be the first case, we believe, in the Ninth Circuit to rule on DOMA's constitutionality, and that's incredibly exciting and significant, so stay tuned. Speaking of the Ninth Circuit, let me tell you about a second case that's a really important one to Lambda Legal and I think to a lot of others. Okay, so some of you may sh have shared my heartbreak when Janet Napolitano left Arizona and she went to the Federal Department of Homeland Security and left behind in her wake was a terrible situation. We have a legislature there that's extraordinarily hostile to LGBT people and a governor now that shares that view. And the legislature and the governor acted together to pass a bunch of legislation targeting a whole bunch of different groups, including lesbians and gay men. And so as soon as Janet had left town, they passed a bill that stripped Arizona state workers of their domestic partner coverage. It's one of the most mean-spirited things we've ever seen. So we sued. This was the first case of its kind in federal court. And we got a preliminary injunction, which is an order from the judge that keeps those benefits turned on. So I want to mention the way this impacts a couple of very strong women we're working with in Arizona because we're really proud of them. One of them is Tanya, and she couldn't participate in the case for a bunch of reasons, but she's one of the people who benefits from this order. She is a two-time cancer survivor. She has a genetic predisposition to cancer, and the likelihood of having cancer again in her lifetime is a virtual certainty. Without this health coverage, she is on her own. If she gets cancer, that's it. She has no access to coverage whatsoever. This order that we won helps keep that coverage in place for her. We're defending that order on appeal now. We had oral argument on Valentine's Day. I'd like to think that's a sign. And the Ninth Circuit is going to be ruling any day now about this incredibly important concept, which is when our federal constitution says 
equal protection for gay people. Shouldn't that mean that we should get equal pay for doing equal work? And shouldn't that include health insurance? We think so. The trial judge agreed. We hope the Ninth Circuit is going to agree as well. And I have to give just a special shout out to our host, Laura, who played a moot court judge for me before I did all of my hearings in the case. It thrilled me and really helped contribute to our presentation of the case. All right, now, in terms of cases to watch, let me tell you about the third one. So this may be the next case about gay people that the Supreme Court of our country hears. This case is called Adar versus Smith, and something that I think is incredibly important about it is that it involves gay people as parents, because the underlying facts involve Mickey and Oren. They're a gay male couple. They adopted a Louisiana child, and as many of us who, who love parents or know parents or are parents know, you must have an accurate birth certificate for your kid. You need it to make medical decisions. You need it for school purposes. You need it to travel. You've got to have an accurate birth certificate. And so they went to the state of Louisiana and they said, we'd like a birth certificate showing that we are both the legal fathers of this child. Louisiana said, no, not going to do it. No accurate birth certificate for your child because you're unmarried. So this flew in the face of another case that we had done in Oklahoma, and we won that case. Recently, a different federal court in this Louisiana case ruled in the opposite direction, creating a split in the law. That's exactly the moment when it makes sense to ask the United States Supreme Court to step in, resolve the law, settle for once and for all what the Constitution requires, and what kinds of protections everyone can count on. We've asked the Supreme Court to hear this latest case out of Louisiana. We will know by mid-October whether they're going to take the case, and so we think that if they do, this could end up being very, very significant. We're very excited about it. Okay, so with that spotlight, I'm gonna give you just a little taste of a few other things we're doing across the country. There's, there's so much. I can't tell you about all of it, but you're gonna have to go to our website or come find me and ask me questions. I'd love to tell you more. In New Jersey, we just filed a marriage case. That state has civil unions. They've had it long enough. It's not working. It's time for full equality. In Wisconsin, we just won a victory defending their domestic partnership status that's been on the books for a short while, giving same-sex couples death and disaster rights. When you're most vulnerable, your partner is ill or has passed away, these are the critical protections you count on. Anti-gay forces sued. We intervened in the case. We won at the trial court. We're defending that now on appeal. Also in Wisconsin, in federal court, and this just, I tell you, this just tells me how far we've come. The legislature decided to take aim at transgender inmates and decided to yank away all federal funding for any health care for transgender inmates related to their gender identity. And as many of you know, the consequences of pulling people off hormone therapy and denying them other care are absolutely terrible and they can be irreparable. We just had the Seventh Circuit Federal Court of Appeals agree with us and actually say, as a matter of law, this amounts to torture. It violates the Eighth Amendment. It is cruel and unusual punishment, and this is a decision that we will now be able to cite across the country as an example of the correct reasoning and how to understand the need for trans people to have access to health care. In Hawaii, some of you may know they had a status, third class status, called reciprocal beneficiaries. Nobody knew what it was. <laughs> Nobody understood it. It wasn't good enough. So we had prepared a lawsuit and we were going to sue for civil unions. That was the most we could ask for, given the way their constitution is right now. So we were prepared to do it, and we held off. We kept being told, oh, wait, 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 the legislature's about to fix this, they're gonna fix this. And we waited and waited, and finally, enough was enough. They didn't, they didn't fix it, they dragged their feet, we filed the lawsuit, and suddenly, the legislature remembered how to pass a civil unions bill for same-sex couples. So, very, very happy to have that case mooted right out. People have civil unions in Hawaii starting in January. The last thing I want to mention, saving the best for last. So since we had this gathering last year, I don't think that anybody in this room could forget that we had a spate of really tragic, horrific suicides. There was a cluster of our youth who killed themselves. They jumped off of bridges, they hung themselves. And it felt like for just a moment, people across the country paused and were starting to understand that the lived reality for our youth just does not begin to match what the laws require of the way we should treat them, which is with full dignity and equal respect. And so we've been working very, very hard on behalf of youth, and I'm happy to announce two victories this year. Um, we've won a victory for a young man in New York who was relentlessly 
abused and bullied and harassed at school, and because of this initial victory, he's going to get to have his full day in court and proceed with his case. We also just won a case on behalf of a um, young person in Indiana. I should say we settled the case. Um, after school, barred this woman's access, this trans student's access to her prom. There was a woman who literally stretched her arm across the doorway and refused to let the student in because she had shown up in a fabulous ball gown, which is what she was meant to wear that night. And she, was meant to, she ended up spending the rest of the night in the parking lot while all of her friends got to go inside and have that one night and the, the time of their lives. So we sued and made an example out of that school and they finally had had enough and they gave up and they settled. I we're planning to do that wherever we find students being treated unequally. Okay, you guys have had enough. Thank you so much for listening to these docket updates.